and uh, welcome to the 22nd uh, uh, leadership reverse lectures by uh, Irina Goz. And uh, I'm, as you would have seen uh, from all of our uh, communication with you, she has been a last year's uh, uh, tech veteran, uh, especially in uh, Microsoft. And uh, if you have seen her profile, it's absolutely a dream uh, kind of run uh, for any tech veteran. She has been uh, with my Microsoft for almost about 20 years. And uh, till uh, recently, she was uh, executive director and also the head of Microsoft Technology Center in Bangalore. And uh, just about a month ago, she has been promoted as the chief operating officer of uh, Microsoft India. And uh, in her capacity, like we said, she also heads the Microsoft Technology Center in Bangalore. And most importantly, I think uh, she heads everything that uh, all of us and especially all the businesses get uh, affected immensely. You know, where she leads the team of uh, cloud specialists and technical evangelists with uh, diverse capabilities across Microsoft six, uh, you know, uh, solution areas. Like I said, all of them get affected, <laughs> the businesses as well as all of us. First one is uh, Azure infrastructure, Azure data and uh, AI, uh, uh, AI and uh, AI and Azure applications, Microsoft 365. And, dyna um, uh, and uh, Dynamics 365 and security solutions, as well as uh, uh, lifetime support offerings. And she's a graduate from uh, IIT uh, uh, Banaras Hindu University, where uh, you know, recently she was awarded a lifetime achievement and uh, distinguished uh, alumni award from IIT BHU. And she also has done an MBA from uh, XLRA. And most importantly, she uh, heads and she's a founder of a very interesting uh, uh, NGO, if I may say, so called as uh, My Little Bed. Even before she came here today, uh, you know, she was uh, she has been busy throughout the day, even today, uh, with a healthcare camp for, for that foundation. And also, she is an active uh, supporter of uh, women entrepreneurs, where she is uh, uh, the supporter of Microsoft for so startups, as well as she's a trustee of an, another organization called uh, uh, Sondra Connect, which is is an exclusive uh, uh, woman entrepreneurship uh, one entrepreneurs uh, platform and most interestingly i would i should advise and i should strongly recommend all of you to keep uh, watching her every monday she writes something called as a monday vibes and this is a very very last i don't know where she gets time from the kind of depth of coverage that she uh, puts in every week and indeed in fact if you start collecting all of each one of them that's a phenomenal learning because uh, you know it comes with her perspectives along with the uh, perspectives of the book that or you know the event that she's writing about so wonderful uh, uh i mean like i said just about uh, a dream career kind of thing. Thank you so much, Irina. Welcome to this uh, 22nd uh, Leadership News Lecture. And uh, today, uh, she also has given us a rare chance of, uh, uh, I would say, you know, uh, unintended uh, or maybe an unasked uh, bonus, uh, you know, having him, uh, having Mr. Sandeep with us today. And Sandeep, again, is a tech veteran. He has got 23 years of experience. And uh, you know, he's a graduate of uh, engineering uh, from RB College of uh, Engineering in Bangalore. And she also has done a, a, an executive certification program from ISP in the area of data sciences. And currently, he's the director of Microsoft Technology Center. And he's going to join uh, Irina for uh, giving us a I think the bird's eye view in terms of a demonstration of some of the te technologies that's going to shape us. Over to both of you, uh, uh, Irina. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Nagendra. Those were extremely kind words. Uh, and while I get started, I must say it's a delight to be here with so many participants who are kind of in that phase that we are really looking at uh, both uh, sharing with you what we have learned in the entire um, space of technology and what it can do for our customers, but also, frankly, uh, going along with you and doing some reverse learning on the way in terms of where you see the future coming along and where you think we can definitely shape things together. So what um, I've put here together is uh, uh, something called the technology trends for the decade. Now I'll be kind of breezing through some 10 of them. And what I've really done is uh, requested Sandeep. Uh, he leads our Microsoft Technology Center to give you a sneak peek because seeing is believing. So he'll uh, really bring about four of those technologies to the foray. So I'll kind of uh, put across these uh, um, slides up right now uh, and talk through these trends. Most imp more importantly, what I'll try to do is also kind of talk through as to what we are seeing as customers are talking about, right? Now, and um, I, I also want to kind of uh, touch upon the fact that in the last two years, things have changed dramatically. 
what was there say even 24 months back before the pandemic that has got gone through a rapid change reasons being many um having said that the technology agility the decision making and people's need to look at technology both for taking across thing at scale or driving growth has become the core and the cornerstone so here's sharing some of them with you uh, with a bit of a perspective as to what customers are doing do keep on chiming in with your views your comments feedback in the chat window we'll be very happy to look at um, questions comments uh, towards the end of the session so uh, quickly kind of taking in as to what has been the changing trend line that we are seeing three things people centricity people centricity became even more pronounced in the course of the pandemic think about it um you and i uh, not all of us might have been so much into uh, an e-commerce way of dealing and leading with things in our life but frankly left with no choice uh, but to kind of do things from home not just did it become a part of our life but frankly we realized that that's the way that it can be taken across and now given the convenience and the swiftness with which it can happen we really think that let us do actually online first before we go on prem now sh shifting streams to what is happening in the enterprises banking now banking when you think about it when i thought about my father he was a person who was very much a, a person who will be going to the bank doing things out there with a banking clerk or a professional who will kind of be aiding him but having said that now that the online convenience agility was brought to the doorstep for him that kind of changed his behavior as well so it's frankly transcended generations in various forms of life so the cornerstone of that is that people centricity has to be the core in anything that gets designed the second part is intelligence driven organization given the fact that people were really not kind of having that level of affinity with their customers data driven decision making data driven agility and data driven ways of reaching out to customers became really really important so intelligent intelligence driven organizations kind of leverage data across multiple silos took decisions real time and ensure that they implemented things fast failed fast learned fast and went into that cycle and the third part is what actually a ceo satya nadella also keeps talking about is is the tech intensity so tech intensity for us is not just being technically agile in what we create but actually ensuring that the entire ecosystem has a great balance of how people become technically able and ensuring that digital transformation is happening at that pace so which means that actually it's not the technology players who are bringing in the technology it's the tech intensity of every organization which shows up in the way that they are kind of driving the next level of digital transformation so with that i'll be sharing the set of the, the tech trends there'll be about 10 of them um the first one here is about industry clouds now when you think about cloud cloud led innovation was something that became not just things people thought were good to do but it became something that people needed to do so in india when you think about it various organizations are in various stages of maturity some are really at the help and they are cloud native born in the cloud you can think about the startups etc who are kind of out there then there will be the large enterprises who have kind of taken a long strand and a, uh, a st a steadily moving across there but they have also been weighing out as to which processes can be taken and then there are certain others which because of regulatory norms have been taking measured decisions now one was the movement to the cloud the next level is the advent of the industry cloud so what is an industry cloud cloud when you think about it you might be thinking of, about the various uh, hyperscalers say microsoft google amazon etc but what does an industry cloud bring an industry cloud actually tailors things for the industry so think about say a healthcare industry now a healthcare industry will be requiring things say from a clinical informatics say a patient management 
clinical and operational insights, etc. And all these delivered in a HIPAA compliant manner. So what industry clouds do is that all things which are required for a particular industry are available in a modular format. Depending on which industry needs which modules, they will be taking that part of it. But the benefit is that whatever are the uh, things which have to be taken in consideration for it to be readily deployed from an auditory requirement or from a compliance requirement, the agility requirement, security requirement, the cloud provides that to you so that the customer literally doesn't have to kind of check it out that are these meeting different norms. Now, what it does, it brings across various data models, the APIs and industry specific components and interfaces together. So net net, they bring across a very, very quick and an agile way of taking things to the market. So what does it mean? What it means for say any startup or any ISV, when they're taking solutions across to the market, they quickly snap in to these industry clouds as well, which are created by large platform um, manufacturers or vendors. And when you take that across, there is a lot of efficiency in what can be bring, brought across. This also helps in say breaking across any silos, which might be there in various data models within various applications so that there's a seamless way of flowing. So that was the first one, that was industry cloud. Now, the second one, Flowing from there is the fact that edge is the new cloud. Sometime back when we moved across to the cloud world, actually, I mean, the it was a eureka moment because we really thought that the computing power going across to the cloud ensures that things can be very much more scalable and uh, um, the capacity to plug in, plug out, ensure that an agile way of kind of delivering things is there at the hilt the logical extension of that is the convergence of the intelligent edge and the intelligent cloud. Now, what? why is this happening? Computing at one end is becoming increasingly distributed and it is really embedded in the real world. You can see it in various things in what you do and um, what you do in everyday life. Say, for example, the variables um, that you and I wear or the safety monitoring of oil rigs or say whatever is happening in various kinds of things in the infrastructure layer, et cetera. Now, when these are kind of put across at the edge, then the entire thrust has to be that there can be AI models which can be deployed for inferencing this data in real time and then ensuring that the closed loop between the cloud and the edge happens in the most effective manner, most importantly, also ensuring that whatever is happening at the edge gets inferred at the edge and rendered at the quickest possible time. An example of this is that say IoT devices, things which are there in your car, when you're kind of taking, thing, taking your car across on to remote places. Now for anything that you might be doing in a particular instance, if it is say for an experimentation nature or whatever, for that data to go across to the cloud and then infer information and come back, that would have taken a lot more time. Now, if you can bring that power right at the edge and infer it, that would be real time. Think about it, things which are happening at the other end in terms of the exploration to Mars and how much of that can be inferred at the edge for everything not to come back to the cloud in a to and from manner. Of course, that's another um, um, in, introspection, introspection that we have to do as to how much is required, but those are extremes, right? Um, an important data point here is that the edge will increase sixfold, which is a lot in the next few years from about 5% today to about 25 to 30% by 2025. So which means the opportunities will only become immense, right? So that's the next. Now, a natural extension of that is also what we are doing along with AI. I wouldn't go too much into data and AI because that's been there, data being the new fuel of what we do and AI the possibilities of everything that we have to do is immense. The only one that I do want to capture here today is open AI innovations. And the figure that you can see on the right, which you can see that this is the future. 
when you kind of input something in natural la language, say the input prompt saying, recite the first law of robotics, and then that getting rendered, right? Now, how is that happening? This is happening on the basis of open AI innovations, which is really enriching the natural language processing power. So what it really does is open AI's the core operating model is to conduct research in a very, very friendly manner that benefits humanity. So the first glimpse of this came via GPT-3, which is in fact the world's most advanced uh, language model that powers the next gen generation of applications across various industries. So whether it's summarizing difficult text for a second grader, say supposing something has been told in a class in a manner that the kid is not understanding, then summarizing that in a manner that the kid can understand that can be done by it. It can be taken across to in a BPO environment. When, when say, uh, an interaction is happening with the client, the client has said a set of things, inferring that in a way and rendering it with solutions can also be done by GPT-3. And sentiment detection, turning meeting notes into summary, many, many implications of that. So the, the, the ultimate way of thinking about this is that how can it bridge the human connection between what say people are doing right now in a streamlined way that is both accurate here and now and relevant. So that is what open AI with GPT-3 in a natural language processing manner would be doing. With that, let me come to the next one, which is intelligent automation. Now, all of you would have been kind of hearing things in the ro robotic automation process automation space and AI things which became a lot more, I would say, um, needed in the period of the pandemic also was the fact that when people realized that in the setup of their organizations or whatever was being done in a manual manner, people were actually not available. The need for ensuring automation with the highest level of intelligence became a real here and now problem. Right. So that is what brought in the advent of creating the end to end processes which are resilient and which can create a lot more things right from character recognition, OCR led way or ensuring that process mining to create an end to end process which can think, which can learn and adapt on its own becomes a lot more centric. Right. So intelligent automation is something sometimes also referred to as the intelligent process automation. And examples of this, um, you can think of in an automobile factory. For example, when you apply this, you can um, minimize any kind of a human mistake or think about any scenario in a store environment or any environment which require, requires a lot of documentation. When you're kind of putting such processes, you actually eliminate not just a lot of people needed intervention, but the more important part is the proactive and the intelligence which can be provided over and above that, minimizing any level of supervision which would have been needed at any point of time and thereby bringing a lot more automation out there. So things which would have needed a repetitive manual way of looking at what needs to be done in any kind of a finance-led mode or a factory-led um, uh, operation or a BPO environment, those kind of things is where this is kind of having a lot of prevalence. Now, a natural extension of this is the low-code and no-code evolution. Um, in Microsoft, we have the Power Platform the power app uh, applications, which kind of uh, really take this across to the next hell. So think about this as the new and the next way in which enterprise applications will be built. And if you were to kind of think of a revolution which happened when ERP or enterprise resource planning came into being, when they became the heart and soul of any, um, any say manufacturing setup or any factory led operation or anything which was kind of having a lot of data getting cre created, a lot of process which had to be automated, etc. Think of this as the next wave in which this will be kind of democratizing what has to be done. Now, why is this so critical? So the, the overall feeler is that around 500 million new apps will be built in the next five years 
which is more than what was built in the last 40 years. So when you think about this, on one hand, we really have a deficit of engineers who will be able to do that. And on the other hand, this can also and be very well done by people like you and me, people who have a business or a functional domain understanding and who can translate the need of what is required for that particular process into a code. Now, how can that happen? This can happen via these solutions, which are low code and no code way of putting these needs into an application. So the average cost, if you think about it, of developing an application via these kind of solutions is about 74% lesser with these kind of platforms. And the only way, if you kind of think about how today's digital world will be going forward in the app innovation arena will be by developing apps, which are actually collaborative, which are relentless, impactful, agile, and really cost effective. And that is where the low code and no code way of building applications really takes a center stage. Okay, now, while you've built applications, you've taken things across to the cloud, you've built a lot of things on the edge. One of the things that every organization is losing sleep every day is how secure are they? Because all of you would be knowing that cyber criminals have been on the prowl even more in the context of how the pandemic kind of spread out. Because the footprint of the area which got exposed was way higher. So the hybrid work model really represents a lot of new security challenges. And almost 75% of the IT decision makers felt that their organizations were more vulnerable to security threats. The expansion of, say, access, the increased number of endpoints, many more devices which were brought across to the fore, brought in a lot more new threats and risks. And while all the employee, employees kind of uh, want to ensure that they implement all the things required from a safe way of accessing things, there are many, many layers which are not always protected, right? So what does it mean in terms of ensuring that you bring in a lot more secure way of looking at things? So the future of security, the need literally is to have things which are passwordless integrated and a com combination of outside in and inside out approaches. So what it will translate to is that when users need access to critical and private, private information, a lot of times the vulnerability is due to the weak passwords, weak passwords, which is often the entry points for any of the attackers, right? So even nobody basically likes facts. So even if we do not like it, and even if it is inconvenient, that is the place where it becomes the prime target for any attackers. So the entire philosophy behind this, that how can we think about implementing things which is zero trust framework, which literally means that not to trust anything, anybody, verify explicitly, grant the least privileged access. You have to assume breach and then ensure that you're implementing the highest level of security to be ready for anything which has to happen at that point of time. And finally, security needs to be literally a part of the product design and the organization culture as you're building up things. So from security, let me quickly jump into an area which is very close to everybody's heart um, out here. And that's about accessibility. And um, statistics about that is very high in terms of the number of people who have any kind of disability, which can be related to vision, hearing, neurodiversity, mobility, et cetera. Now, building this, into the entire fray of the products ensures that the user has a lot of intake irrespective of the disability that they have. Things like how are you making language a lot more simpler? Things like how are you making vision a lot more easier, hearing, etc. And also ensures that the employability 
of a lot more people comes into the foray. So our Windows platform, for example, for many, many years has got various elements of accessibility embedded into the operating system so that users, irrespective of where they're coming from, have a much more closer way of aligning to things and ensuring that they experience things in a way similar to anybody who's kind of having it without a disability. There is a white paper also, which is engineering software for accessibility, which kind of calls about the philosophy with which we look at things when we build these things, these things grounds up. Now, quickly moving across to one of the things um, which, is becoming, which is becoming a growing need in the last few years, which is sustainability. Sustainability, I think um, no need to emphasize the fact how good it is for the planet, but the fact that it is really, really good for businesses as well, because it really brings across a lot more economic growth while reducing emissions. 94% of the top CEOs are currently thinking about how to make sustainability and reach the end goals towards carbon negative, waste negative, and water positive by a stipulated time frame. Now, in this um, arena, there have been lots of things which have been done, how to enable efficiencies. The three, the four figures which are out here in terms of 60 billion energy optimization opportunity, that's for real. Now, if that comes into being, globally, governments and utilities alone are expected to spend up to $60 billion by, 20, uh, by uh, 2028. Another uh, pointer is around how precision agriculture is expected to grow to $12 billion in market value by 2025. The bold climate action in the areas of energy, cities, food, and land use is looking to deliver at least $26 trillion in economic benefits through 2030. And finally, the value of global market for carbon emissions offsets could be worth $200 billion by 2050. Now, those are very large figures, which are there from various studies which have been done, which definitely means that all of us, how we look at coercively taking this as a need for the hour, build this into the processes and ensure that we are measuring ourselves incrementally towards that is very, very critical and important. With that, let me move across to some of the exciting things. The first one is about extended reality. So with hybrid work becoming the norm, extended reality technologies will create an online world that incorporates an entire spectrum of this, basically from augmented reality, virtual reality, the 3D holographic avatars, videos, and many, many other means of communications to help communicate in both the consumer and the enterprise space. Today, enterprises focusing on, say, mixed reality headsets, such as HoloLens, allow users to interact with holograms and create literally immersive experiences that can be used to solve many, many problems in real life, which are setting ranges across say, many industry forays, such as construction, factory floors, um, hospitals, education, and many, many more. We will be seeing some of these in the demo that Sandeep will be um, shortly showing across. And with that, let me um, talk about some of the benefits which organizations are seeing with mixed reality. So these are certain examples which kind of are very tangible to show that what is the real ROI which organizations are saying. Say Mercedes-Benz seeing 40% reduction in travel costs, L'Oreal, seeing 50% reduction in intervention time. You have Lockheed and Martin seeing 90% reduction in touch labor. And finally, in case Western Reserve, 50% improvement in student scores. So these are very tangible and real things which are happening with the realm and bringing in mixed reality. And with that, let me come to the final um, tech trend and possibly something which has been a buzzword for quite some time right now which is Metaverse. Now, of course, Metaverse has come into the fray very, very uh, forcefully in the last, say, 18 months. Not that it was not there. It had been there for a longer period of time, but putting that into 
ensuring that use cases are becoming a part of problem solving or a part of how it can become real is how things are kind of coming across, right? Now, let me kind of give a little bit of a background out here. We had, say, four stages. Web 1.0 was when users were consuming it, which literally mean, uh, uh, meant that we were paying companies. That was the foray in 1990s and 2000s. Then came Web 2.0, when users were consuming and creating content. So this was the advent of, say, social media, which was Facebook, blogs. And it was literally an era when you were the product and your data was being sold. Then came Web 3.0. So users were consuming the content and creating the content. In addition, they were also owning what they created. So basically, how do you own and pay? So things such as blockchains, NFTs, etc. came into being in this era. And next is Web 4.0, which is Metaverse, wherein you did all the three. You do all the three, which is consume, create, you own. And you are, basically you are in the space, which is kind of experience, experiencing everything. So Metaverse literally is a shared virtual three-dimensional space where each of us can connect, network, share, work, and play. Now the key technologies which come into play out here is the interconnection of people, places, things, and processes. And how it happens is, with a set of key technologies. So you have, say, blockchain for cryptocurrencies, you have non-fungible tokens, you have um, artificial intelligence, which is kind of rendering these things to happen. How is it reaching the last mile is through massive bandwidth and also through a lot of interoperability. Some of the pivotal points here is also about the reckoning that in um, the last quarter call, there were about 120 references by Fortune um, uh, 500 companies in terms of what they are doing. It's also about the fact as to how the IPO of Roblox came in, the listing of NFT. And Bloomberg actually talks about this being a 800 billion. It could be even more. There's a lot which is happening here. Having said that, the overall way that you have to think about this is what are some of the ways people are making it real? And some of the things out here are related to what you can do with say training and simulation, with how you can do remotely, you can guide tasks. How can you ensure remote assistance happens? How can you design and prototype in a distributed virtual world? How can you provide assistance for sales for somebody who's kind of seeing a product in a far away place and contextual data overlays. Um, in India, lots of innovation happening. Say paint industry is talking about how you can see things in a virtual world for, from the comfort of your home. A lot of hyper, hyper malls talking about how you can see things in the virtual world, but get it delivered right at your home. A lot of insurance companies talking about uh, if there was a product which, which, which is NFT enabled, how do you ensure that in the metaverse? A lot of jewelry organizations talking about how can you literally experience a virtual way of wearing things right at your home? So these are things which are not very far away right now, out here and now. And with that, Sandeep, let me pass it over to you to show and make some of these things and make it come real. Awesome. Thanks so much, Irina. I'm going to share my screen right away and we'll get going. I have to include some sound here and share my screen. Awesome. So, yeah, I think it's, it's great to be here. And also, uh, it's, it's fantastic that on a Saturday evening, we're talking tech and nothing like showcasing tech. Irina, so you spoke about 10 things. I'm going to take three out of those four. I'm going to probably you know, add life to those uh, thematic right away. So, um, of course, I saw a few questions in the chat window. Some of them may get answered in my demo. Otherwise, we'll be more than happy to take them as we go along, right? First things first, I think edge computing, right? A lot of time people perceived edge computing to be a science, fiction, uh, science project, right? It's, it's not anymore. Uh, edge is a reality. As Irina rightly said, um, inferencing closer to where data is getting generated is a reality. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a simulation of classroom of the future, right? So typically, if you look at with the current hybrid work environment, you will have, let's say in higher education, some students attending class in person, 
uh, I'm going to play this and you're going to have some students joining online, right? For a teacher, it becomes important to stay in touch in terms of how people are joining, who is attending, what's their, um, I would say, attentiveness in the class. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they taking note of what they're talking about? It's very difficult to keep track across both these mediums, which is virtual and in person, right? So this is a classic example of, yes, um, there are CCTV cameras all over the place, example in this classroom also. But then taking that camera free to the cloud is not practical, right? I mean, it's massive, it's, it's in high fidelity, et cetera. So now, um, imagine this classroom, this, this, this campus uh, would definitely have, would, you know, when it's edge computing, you will have an infrastructure where we were deployed a inferencing model, which is AI model. Here we deployed a model to actually understand how many people actually walk into the classroom and their emotions, right? So if you see the graph here, as people are stepping out, it's actually marking that yes, people um, are leaving the class. The same thing will happen in the online space also. Now, interestingly, if you look at it, I can go and check on what, what has been the, what, what's been the emotions, right? Imagine um, in, in a classroom, let's say people are there for, you know, let's say three months, uh, one trimester, and you want to understand what's been the pattern in the classroom, right? So I can actually go and check here. I can put a timestamp and so fetch, right? In terms of, yes, uh, let me just pick up one student just to know what's been um, the dominant uh, emotion here, right? It says happy 40, you know, 0.4%, um, and neutral, which is 60%, right? So in the span of you know, 12 minute classroom, as an example here, we could understand emotions of people, right? This is one example that means today, ability for us to do inferencing closer to, to where data is getting generated is a reality. That means the data is right there in terms of video feed. Inferencing is happening right at the physical real estate, right? That's a classic example of edge company. That means uh, the model is trained in the cloud and deployed to edge infrastructure for inferencing. Yeah, this is the first demo I want to showcase, right? Let's move on. Um, second one, I think Irina spoke about OpenAI. Um, that's basically world's largest uh, natural language, uh, NLP model, right? So I'll showcase an example of natural language generation. Yeah, so let's look at this. Now, I'm on GPT-3 Playground, by the way. You know, if you're interested, you can actually go up and sign up OpenAI. They'll give you some free credits. But here I am. Uh, um, Andeep, we are lagging, we are losing you. Uh, just so you know, the power of GPT-3, given author's name, vocabulary, it can actually create a book for you. Yeah, that's the power of this model. So let me just uh, run this model right away, right? So I asked about an outline. Look, you know, how beautifully it gave me five points right, in terms of what is metaverse, uh, right? In terms of human lives. So if I have to write an essay, I'll probably follow this pattern, right? This is one example. Um, the second one, um, let's look at this is an interesting one, by the way, um, right? So this is, again, a conversation, um, I would say, example. Uh, let me put this question, right? So here the question is, um, I want my assistant to help me uh, on a specific question I have. So I'm going to place that question right here, right? It's a bot. Um, so um, the scenario is, yes, um, I'm a professor. I'm trying to address students for embarking on a challenge, right? That's what I put in here. And I'm asking the bot, I'm going to bold it so that you can see this. I'm asking the bot, say, hey, can you please share and generate some content so that I can motivate them and make them ready for the challenge, right? Let's see what response I get. Now, this is where the AI is in action and it's beautifully telling me, you know what? Uh, firstly, it's important to set your goals, identify what you want to achieve in the class. Um, and it's telling me that second, develop a plan of action, break down the challenge in smaller manageable, uh, manageable steps. And finally, look, so it, it's so contextual. It says, don't go to step positive and bring yourself, right? So my question was help me motivate students and it's beautifully coming back with a response, um, right? I couldn't probably stop there. I, I got probably, you know, um, you know, I got, uh, you know, I want, I want more, right? The, the looks like there is a lot of intelligence here. I say, you know what? I'm also looking at composing a song, right? I want to inspire students with probably a song and I want a few lines, right? And uh, let's see what comes back. Right when it runs, and I should have the response anytime. Wow.
Sandeep, I think uh, uh, we have lost you. <laughs> yeah, Sandeep, um, can you? Um, I think we have lost Sandeep right now. Can you hear me, Dr. Nagendra? I can hear you, uh, Irina. I think Sandeep, I think the connection no issue. Yeah, no, yeah, problem. no problem. So while we wait for Sandeep, um, let's do one thing. Um, I see a couple of questions which are there in the chat window. Mm. Sandeep is back. Sandeep, you're back. We lost you. Uh, in the, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Basically, this is uh, uh, Saturday. I don't know. Big this internet works great. Uh, but yeah, hope I'm. I can see my screen now. Yes. Yeah. We Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, I hope you saw the last demo where I generated some lyrics. That's when it got cut. Yeah. So that's basically uh, the power of natural language generation. Uh, let's move forward. Uh, we'll move into an interesting area, which is mixed reality, right? Uh, by the way, I would have loved to do a live demo. Uh, I was ready to live demo and, and look, internet is flaky. So uh, just one hour back, I recorded for you. Okay, I'm going to play this. So this is about a disaster recovery scenario in terms of, you know, in terms of in future, I would not say future, in current times, if uh, you as, uh, you know, you, 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 you're basically responsible for the city in terms of, yes, something was wrong, I'm responsible to help people, uh, you know, come out of disaster, etc. So how do you plan that? Before that, let me show you one use case where, um, you know, in terms of, in, in the current times, you're talking about uh, predictive monitoring, right? Uh, I'll, I'll showcase one example before I get there. In terms of predictive monitoring, um, how it probably was perceived to happen in the past. When I say past, so far, uh, we always are stuck to 2D screens, flat screens, right? So here's an example of elevator company, Tisimka, right? Uh, what you're seeing is a real-time stats coming from a elevator, you know, elevators across the United States. So here I see an alert. That means green says everything's fine. I see uh, an orange alert here. I'm going to see uh, what has gone wrong. It looks like Virginia is at the center. There is something wrong with the elevator. I'm going to see details, right? It tells me that there's an alert in elevator number two. Uh, I'm going to click that. And uh, look, so it says elevator number two. Yes, it's functioning fine for sure. But there is an uh, alert says in the next eight days, this elevator, some of the component might have a critical failure, right? So this is a predictive model. I'm going to go and probably address it uh, ahead of time. But this is an example of how things are happening so far in terms of, yes, we're all stuck to 2D screens. But let me showcase an example in terms of sometimes if, if a disaster happens, um, what is future, right? By the way, when I say future, mixed reality as a technology has been there for probably 70, 80 years now, right? But more than ever, every single enterprise looking at how they can bring an immersive experience, right? This current decade is all about experiences. And let me just play that video. I'm going to just give you a commentary as it goes along, but uh, let's look at this, right? So what you're seeing right now here um, is basically um, the visual of uh, Seattle downtown, right? So an earthquake has happened, which is what we'll see in the letter. I'm going to play the video in a few seconds. And as, um, let's say, a person responsible for, for, uh, for, for people's lives, how do I respond to in real time? And how I can, I can plan uh, that step forward, right? So what you want to see is a visual view of Seattle. Let's, let's, let me play this for you. Widespread. I hope you can get the audio as well. Yes, we can. Perfect. So what you're seeing here right now, I'm actually planning to sit out now. Your team is working in Priority Zone 1. Our efforts are focused on downtown Seattle, which to display on the map. This is all real-time data coming in, by the way. Yeah, in terms of city of Seattle, um, I can see the roads. I can highlight roads. I'll know where the conditions are in real time. Right? I could have seen this 2D also, but 3D is a lot immersive, more meaningful, and you can take a lot more decisions faster. I want to see the Wi-Fi networks, if they're all active. Yes, they're all active, looks like that. And I also get to see the networks there, right? Get and by next. the way, uh, this is again, a uh, beautiful view of Seattle downtown. And I'm actually looking at all the Wi-Fi networks to make sure they're all active. And I'm going to, I'm just turning around, uh, just to see, um, you know, if any networks which are down. Probably I get to see one network very soon where it's down. By the way, it's all interactive, right? It's one one-way traffic, you prove it. I can actually go and um, activate Wi-Fi if it's down. Right? I'm going to do that right away. You see that that's back on. And uh, yeah. We are receiving an urgent message from one of our field teams. Right. And while you're in the environment, you get a call. We've lost power in our area and communications remain spotty. Debris is continuing to fall from nearby shelter. 
I've established several waypoints. To plot the route, air tap the start position, then select waypoints and the end location. I'm going to say start here. Let's get, because I have a view of the street map, right? I know where the congestion are, but I'm going to detect that. When you're ready, air tap share to Once send I, the plan to uh, the team. No, air tap, I'm going to send that data back to people who, are, who needs help, right? This is one classic example. And by the way, um, everything you saw is real. Everything you saw is practically possible today. And that's how, that's how um, I was enterprise looking at bringing immersive experience. That means as a plant manager, a city, city mayor, or somebody's managing city, you can be comfortable at home, but you can still manage the entire city at your, at your, your fingertips. Okay. The next experience, this this probably is um, the future of retail. Okay. So okay. what is nice. now uh, nice is basically, you know, um, this is again in the metaverse, 3D space. This is a retail example. This is a glimpse of how um, shopping will happen in the future, right? Uh, you're seeing, by the way, that was that is me in the shopping uh, center, and I'm talking to my colleagues. By the way, what, are, what you're seeing is my view. So I have my colleagues who join in the call, and we're actually going through the retail store and looking at um, the shoes and sneakers, et cetera, and looking at how we can uh, buy that. By the way, uh, there's no commerce involved yet, but this is to give you a glimpse of future. Now, you may, be, you may ask a question saying, hey, how real this is? You know, just to tell you how real this is, I'm going to play one more video, right? Um, what you're seeing here is one of my colleague, um, you know, who joined me from Gurgaon. I, this is my office in Bangalore. And I'm going to play this, right? I want to test, you know, while that person is joining me from, from Gurgaon and I was in Bangalore, I see that person in front of me in my office. Uh, how real it is in terms of, let's say, a high five, right? Uh, let's look at this. You should hear a sound when that happens. Okay. Yeah. Last time. And um, let's see. Come. This is a good experience. Right? So, awesome. end of the day, it's, good, software, good it's all about the sense. Bye-bye. Right? Like and um, yeah. while we all felt future is, um, you know, uh, future is not uh, near, but this is absolutely here and now, honestly. Uh, and of course, early stages, right? With the inception stage. Um, and this is a evidence of how future is getting reimagined, right? All of us living in the internet, even as Web 3.0, this probably is a quick glimpse of uh, the road ahead. And with the point of feedback. So, okay, with that, I'll take a pause and um, Irina and Dr. Nagendra back to you. Thank you so much, Sandeep. That was uh, actually a great elucidation of a lot of the concepts out here. With that, uh, back to you, Dr. Nagendra, for opening it up. Absolutely fascinating. I think uh, it is just out of the world, uh, Irina and uh, Sandeep, I think. What we get experience, I, I think uh, somewhere, uh, uh, Irina. I think uh, well, my first question to you is that I, I, I'm sure if you recollect, you know, when uh, Andrew wrote this, uh, you know, wrote this book called as, uh, in, um, or is a, uh, uh, you know, the paranoid, the only paranoid survive. You know, there he talked about the idea of, uh, you know, zero segment in the sense that, you know, some of these technologies are, I think, uh, very prohibitively expensive you know, for an ordinary man uh, like me or, you know, like all of us, because the kind of investment that, you know, that each one of them require. But in, according to you, how much time do you think, you know, by the time it reaches a common man? Because I think uh, the wild applications are meant for pure business. Yes, I think that's a different uh, altogether. But then it's uh, from the point of view of, uh, you know, common man, for example, let's say you're talking about healthcare. I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, we see a lot of investments happening in the uh, technology space in healthcare, maybe in the telemedicine starting with, and now it's, I think, very advanced. I think uh, robotics has been used uh, in some of the finest hospitals in the country. So the question to you is that how uh, easy or how difficult it is for a, you know, a very high-end technology uh, to reach a common man or let's say to reach maybe a bottom of the pyramid kind of thing in the world, uh, Idina? Wonderful question. And two parts to that in which I'll answer. First is the technology itself becoming economic. And how is the technology ensuring the last mile, right? Now think about it. When we talk yeah. about the metaverse related use cases or what we talked about healthcare, for example, um, a very here and now example was one of our uh, uh, one of the largest um, healthcare organizations across out here in south itself we had one of the surgeons out here reaching across to a remote patient via another doctor and ensuring that he's able to kind of look into that person's overall anatomy in the operation theater with in a mixed reality mode through hololens 
what the doctor was wearing oh. was was not something it was not that everybody had to wear that holo lens right but the holo lens yeah. which the person out there in the ot was wearing helped him to manage ensuring that actually the surgeon was able to he felt he is sitting on the right shoulder and doing the operation and able to annotate where the incision has to be made and the doctor out there next to the patient was able to see the reports etc so that's one thing in terms of how to reach the last mile the second thing when you're looking at say education itself rendered through various devices such as hololens and the others you do not always require the highest end of the device because what happens is the technology which powers that can be made available through various form factors and once that is made available through say tablets through say various other application that brings in a lot more ubiquity is the technology which is powering it not just the wearable or the end uh, gadget itself so i would say both access and ensuring the last mile delivery and the ability to have the uh, the reach to the highest level of excellence of the educator the surgeon or anything else will be uh, will be quite profound absolutely interesting uh, and we have some questions uh, irina and uh, uh, sandeep and with your permission uh, can i take them yes please yeah so there's a question from mr binam and his question is what's a uh, age refers to in this context uh, is this a concept or is just a, a poc thank you binam sure so um edge is a class of scenarios that we basically refer to now when you think about edge you can think about edge that when you're driving say an electric vehicle right whatever are the set of data points which are kind of uh, created in your vehicle is something which is happening on the edge and if you have to do any kind of an analytics of it can you do it here and now real time at the edge or does it have to go across to a connected cloud to render it another um, example is in the world of say agriculture now we are using ai to see as to when the the when is the best time to put the seeds based on the humidity the overall uh, um, soil environment etc kind of a thing now that is being the data is being collected via iot sensors so that is the edge now when you kind of see as to what is happening in that edge and process that information and take here and now real time decision that is what we are referring to sandeep over to you for any additions to here yeah i think after said irina uh, only addition i would do is yes um, edge is will be reality uh, when 5g also becomes a reality i think edge infrastructure in terms of mesh of i would say edge peripheral devices working in unison that's the magic that's that's where the magic happens as we go along and yes it's not a concept it's not a poc it's a reality yeah let me put it that way thank you irina and uh, sandeep and uh, this is a question from mr nishant ranjan his question is uh, is uh, sentimental uh, analysis also possible under gpt3 absolutely see gpt3 um, i think and i think this down call it's a mother of all algorithm when it comes to natural language processing mm-hmm. now be it sentiment analysis or be it conversation ai or will be document processing text extraction right i showcased intelligent conversation using the chatbot i also showcased in terms of how it generates content so everything to do with text um, gpt3 is the most um, trained and highly efficient model as of date by the way it's trained on 1.5 billion parameters Microsoft and Nvidia were joining hands to build something. It's called Megatron. That's been trained on 540 billion parameters. Imagine one hundred billion parameters of power. Four times more of that power. I think that will be magical. Absolutely. I think it's continues to be fascinating. Now the next question is from Mr. Amol. Uh, his question is: As it's going to be four times in the next five years. Uh, uh, right. Uh, I think he's referring to uh, uh, one of the points that you're making, uh, Irina. Right. Uh, and uh, therefore, his question is related to that one. Is as it's going to be four times in the next five years. Isn't the extreme in- uh, interference and usage of AI, and isn't it going to be uh, just? Yeah, uh, it's can... going to cannibalize cannibalize the human capital as it is eliminating the human part. up to a certain extent and isn't this against the mega trend that is sustainability 
Sure. So this has been, uh, I would say, an intriguing questions for question for many years right now. Will it overtake uh, human capital? And um, uh, is this in some way competing? The answer to that is a clear no. So what it is gradually doing is that there are certain parts of the way uh, any organization functions, which can be automated. But what is happening is that as we are progressing and trending to future, the overall headroom for what is required to drive growth innovation is becoming much, much, much more. So what is happening is that you're creating um, an automation for things which are becoming repetitive and you're ensuring that people are doing things which are up in the value chain. I'll give you a very um, simple example. Um, say about 10 years back or maybe six years back, I was uh, leading a function of sales operations and excellence. And at that point of time, there was an AI generated sales forecast which used to be created for sales teams to say that given the historical trends, given the overall way you're looking at the customer dimensions, the overall modeling, et cetera, and about 10 to 20 different parameters models across hundreds of variations, et cetera. This seems to be a likely forecast for the quarter. Of course, I mean, we felt that could never be real because there was an army which was working around making that happen. So we started taking that ahead in the quarter. And when we checked the accuracy at the end of the quarter, it was a whopping 96%. So which meant that, that the, the forecast was right. Did it take away the fact that there had to be people working towards ensuring that you eliminate risks or whatever towards making it happen? The answer to that was no. So the AI was helping see things for the future and ensuring that people are working in a collective manner to make that overall direction happen in a much more holistic way. Great. And uh, this is a question from uh, Baskar. His question is simple, uh, Irina. His question is, uh, just a moment, I think we are having too many questions now. Uh, his question is, how does AI help organizations prevent uh, cyber threats in uh, cyber security? Thank you, Bhaskar. Sure. Um, in a lot of ways, and uh, Sandeep, do feel free to chime in. So we, for example, we have 8 trillion signals which are coming across through our various search engines, through devices, through various active directory and various applications that we have. Now, what it, and what we also do, we've got a lot of associations with industry bodies. We also have our solutions which are deployed at the edge to track and see what is happening. Now, uh, how does AI help? AI actually tries always to check out patterns, anomalies, and give across signals towards whatever is looking out of the normal, match it against things and say that this does not look right, right? So AI is frankly the biggest, uh, I would say, aid that is relied upon for any of the cybersecurity way, cybersecurity um, portfolio of products towards ensuring that we are able to predict and prevent any kind of breaches ahead of time. Absolutely. You know, I think yeah, this is one point, um, right? So if you look at um, today from a, from a reality point of view, uh, as Microsoft, we have something called Microsoft Defender Suite. It actually, in 2020 alone, blocked uh, more than 9.6 billion Marvel threats, right? Uh, almost 35 billion phishing and malicious emails. So that's the power of AI uh, helping us uh, tackle cybersecurity today. And uh, here is a question. I think it's a follow-up question to one of the things that you're going to uh, Irina. It, uh, this question is from Mr. Tinesh Ram. And his question is, uh, currently, HoloLens is used by most of the world's top manufacturers, uh, Audi, Volvo, NASA, uh, and the medical industry like Philip, uh, Philips and also Gig, uh, XR, uh, medical VR application, civil engineering, and uh, etc. Why uh, HoloLens does not have a market in India? Now, India is going, growing energy. How are you seeing the future market in India about HoloLens? Thank you, Tanesh Ram. Sure. And um, actually, Sandeep has been demoing HoloLens. HoloLens is already there in India. Yes. And uh, that's the first one. And we are already uh, already demoing this across to a lot lots, lot of our customers in various um, phrase in the enterprise segment, education customers, uh, and also people kind of uh, who are looking at a B2C and a B2B2C. Uh, we have kind of uh, reaching out to their environment. So whether it's in the um, area of uh, enterprises which are looking at, um, uh, say, uh, retail, uh, healthcare, and many, many forms and shapes. Sandeep, just feel free to add there. 
Yeah, so we launched Netherlands in India in the month of Jan, right? So ever since uh, the launch, I think great interest. In fact, Irina spoke with healthcare and actually posted a YouTube link in the chat room to take a look at that. That's one of the first pilots we've done in India in terms of how how the lens was used. And again, mixed reality com coming coming into the picture. And the remote assist um, doctor scenario that Irina spoke about, it's actually done real. So just take a look at the video. And the journey is bigger in India, honestly. You know, we launched it and hence we're able to speak to it. Otherwise, uh, we, you know, without we make it available, we can't pretty much drive solutions. So right now it's absolutely active and the market is you know, just picking up in India. So uh, 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 Irina, with your permission, because we already overshot the time by three minutes, uh, if it's okay with you, can I take two, three questions if it's okay with both of you? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the next question is from Mr. Chimalakonda. And his question is, uh, can we know your insight on the cryptocurrency and how Microsoft uh, treats it? Uh, is it replaceable with physical currency and uh, your insights, please? Thank you, Chimal Gonda. Can I, can I, can I please, take a go ahead. <laughs> See, look, um, right now, you know, you, if, you, if, you, if you recall uh, Irina's last, um, I would say, trend, which is Metaverse. Now, in the context of Metaverse, I think the foundation for Web 3.0 is blockchain. And even in the world of blockchain, when it comes to commerce, cryptocurrency is perceived to the next big deal, right? Now, there is a massive debate happening on what's the way forward. Uh, will it be legalized? Uh, can I exchange that for the real currency? That's, that's, that, that, those doors are uh, still not open yet. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation on that, honestly, because it's, it's, a, it's a topic uh, which needs a lot more introspection for all of us, because right now, the, right now, um, if, you, if you've heard about Roblox, Sandbox, uh, Decent Reliant, that's where you see cryptocurrency being used to procure NFTs, right? That's, that's where it stands. So blockchain is taking a backseat, but when it's a backseat, it's a foundation. But eventually, crypt cryptocurrency is being used to basically buy stuff in the virtual world. And can exchange that for real currency? No, not yet, right? The answer is not yet. Uh, of course, a lot of uh, things are happening as we speak from policy. So we'll, we'll pause there because... This is not an area where a lot of education exists amongst all of us, to be honest. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, this is a question from uh, Manoj Goyal. And his question is, is Microsoft having any offerings as of now to build enterprise-grade metaverse solutions? Or is it OpenAI uh, that was used in the demos that were uh, presented today? Thank you, Manoj. Hey, quite a few, actually. And uh, <clears throat> I'll just cover some of them. You saw Sandeep also demonstrating some of them. So one is in Microsoft Teams, which is our collaboration platform. So the mesh technology, which comes as a part of Microsoft Teams, creating your avatars and ensuring how you interact, collaborate, and do um, one to many sessions or large streaming, etc. That is one big use case. So collaboration is a big thrust area and Microsoft Mesh is the technology that we're using towards that. The second is in an enterprise uh, B2B scenario, how do we create digital twins? So uh, in the context of that, Sandeep was referring to it as to how for any of the um, arenas such as factory production unit or um, retail floor spaces or healthcare scenarios, etc. How can you create a digital twin and look at ways of ensuring that you're, you're doing either monitoring, predictive maintenance, or any kind of a way that you want to interact between the two? How does that happen? HoloLens, of course, is one of the uh, largest use cases. And HoloLens by itself, how you're taking it to education for um, uh, remote assistance, etc. That is the third one. We also have uh, connected spaces, uh, which is a solution that we do in, say, retail scenarios, wherein, say, when I am walking into a shop floor, and how am I interacting with the shopping in environment? How can the shop provide me provide intelligent uh, options to me based on how I am navigating instead of a person being there. So that is a connected experience, which is there. So many, many such experiences, both in the B2C and the B2B world. Thank you, Irena. I think this last but one question, second last question, uh, uh, Irena and uh, Sandeep. This is a question from Mr. Sriram Ramchandran. And his question is, when you mentioned about precision farming data, will this data going to be available to the farmers at what cost? How will it be available to them? Uh, 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 that's a question from uh, Sriram, uh, Irena and Sandeep. Yeah. Um, the precision farming data. And uh, at what cost is we made available? Uh, sorry, um, that was related to the sustainability one. 
I, I know. I think he was referring to the precision farming data that is going to be made available to the uh, you know farmers. And his question is, uh, at what cost is it going to be made available to all the farmers? Hmm. Um, it's it's not about the data. It's about the technology which will actually enable farmers to have a more, farmers to take a more informed decision about how to and when to do certain sets of things which they were not able to do, which was based on a hunch at uh, earlier points of time. The technology to do this and make it available, we are actually working, our Microsoft research team is also working with a lot of the players in the agriculture industry to make it available. Um, there is an application also that we've created, um, uh, which is a FarmBeat app, and that is that kind is of kind helping of in this uh, direction as well. I think uh, this is the last question, uh, Irina and uh, Sandeep, but it's a fairly long one from uh, uh, Bhumika Singh. And his uh, her uh, statement is, hello, hello, ma'am, thank you for the ins insightful session. Just wanted to ask your opinion about the fact that indeed AI mixed reality metaverse is a great as a part of evolution, but shouldn't they be controlled by law to limit the use of uh, use only in positive way? That's one. And uh, next question is uh, uh, maybe uh, I'm asking because I'm an old school uh, in thought uh, or like uh, uh, that I would prefer closing my gadgets, mobiles, laptop, etc. and go out, explore things that exist in real and more natural way. And seeing the conditions of the world like climate or even human health care, etc. And also the company concentrating on carbon emission and other issues. Should we be exploring more ways to uh, bring something uh, meta real and opposite to meta worse? Yeah, so I've just posted a link across on the chat window as well. Very, very good question. And uh, AI, while it gives a lot of power, I think it also brings across the concept of accountability. So I've just posted something which is related to responsible AI. And when we think about responsible AI, there are quite a few concepts that we think about in that uh, context. How are we ensuring that we do it in the most effective and responsible way so that A, there are no biases, uh, B, there is nothing which is kind of coming across in the way to ensure that the wrong decisions are getting taken. Who is responsible? Does the accountable accountability lie with the technology? No, it's with the person. So how do you kind of take these kind of considerations into uh, cognition when you're making these happens? So if you ask the question, Bhumika, the accountability will be with the technology player with uh, who's kind of creating that level of product or solution. It is not to be left in the limbo, right? Now, the fact that, I mean, uh, limiting it in a positive way, that is always the intent, but they'll always be bad players. How do you kind of create an ecosystem of players and the industry, which can come together to record and kind of see things ahead of time in terms of detecting patterns of what is going wrong and raise triggers. That's the best way of doing it. Sandeep, you want to add? No, no, I appreciate it, you know, I think equal response will AI, something similar for the metaverse will have to come as for long. So it has to be mandated, regulated, I would say, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Sandeep and uh, Irina, and also sorry for you know, overshooting your time, but uh, it's absolutely a pleasure hosting you and having both of you, you know, leading up and then uh, and showcasing this uh, absolutely futuristic, I think very progressive, all sitting and you know, somebody might be cynical about the kind of progress that's been made in the you know, technology space, because maybe because, you know, somebody is not comfortable or maybe because it's uh, expensive and things like that. But I think what you have seen is the absolutely, you know, consumer uh, centric uh, technologies, uh, maybe healthcare, maybe agriculture. I think that they are going to be, uh, you know, uh, all made uh, available to all of us because of, uh, you know, wonderful people like all of you and your colleagues at, uh, you know, technology the center. I think it's always, I mean, in fact, somebody is asking Irina, uh, he wants to know about your success story. I just have to write to him saying that I think we need one more session <laughs> as to how you made it uh, through the uh, whole thing. But it's, you know, I think it's a great uh, uh, session, absolutely a uh, uh, mind-boggling session. And that's what you get to see in the uh, uh, chat box also, uh, you know, Irina and uh, Sandeep. Thank you from uh, all of us once again, and a pleasure hosting you and having both of you. And uh, sorry to have bothered your, uh, you know, Saturday evening, uh, Irina and uh, Sandeep. Absolutely pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagendra and the entire team here. It was a complete pleasure from our side as well, being with you all. Thank you and look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Dina.